<laughs> that, that goes on the cutting room floor, that statement. <laughs> Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. What happened to the family of Joseph Smith after he died? Dr. Mark Shearer is going to tell us that Emma Smith remarried a man by the name of Louis Bideman. We're going to find more about Emma's second marriage in our next conversation, as well as her grandson, Fred M. Smith, who took over leadership after Joseph Smith III died. These are part of Mark's Journey of Faith series, a three-volume work, and we're going to dive into volume two. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. All right. Well, we've probably spent too long on book one, but let's let's jump to book two. Uh, I believe you told me book two covers about a century. Is that right? It does. Go it ahead does. and show it to the camera. Okay. It, it just starts for, with uh, the ex with the aftermath of the death of Joseph Smith Jr. Okay. What happened? What happened to the family? What happened to Nauvoo? The migrations west. Um, uh, but you guys didn't migrate west. No, we did not. We chose not to. <laughs> uh, um, and the problems that the family encountered, having to pay off the debt of the church, um, they still retained ownership over certain properties in Nauvoo, including the mansion house and the red brick store. Um, uh, Those were in Joseph Smith's name, weren't they? Yes, and that was the problem. Okay. That was the problem, because... Sometimes Joseph put church property in the church name, of which Brigham Young grabbed onto. <laughs> but then sometimes he put properties in the family name. And the reason the mansion house and the red brick store are community of Christ, they're community of Christ historic sites. And, and as an aside... We destroy, absolutely destroy, a lot of LDS visitors uh -oh. who discover the Community of Christ sign outside the mansion house rather than the LDS sign. <laughs> I, no, I shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't. I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but anyway, okay. All right. So anyway, uh, what happened to the, to the family, um, the difficulties they encountered, uh, the the warlike setting of of the family uh, of of militia coming into Nauvoo, the escape of Emma with the children on the on a steamboat heading north up to Whiteside County, hmm. uh, Illinois. Emma had absolutely she's very clear about this. She had absolutely no intention, no intention of doing anything with the church. Uh, she leased out the the, the mansion house. Um, to her, uh, moving up into Illinois, her her brother lived not far down the road. Uh, for her to move up to Illinois uh, was an escape, and she took her children with her. Um, those who those who would go, and including Joseph the third. I mean. Because he was 11 years old when yeah, his father yeah, died. Yeah. And then, then Alexander was just a, a year or two younger. Uh, um, David, uh, she was pregnant with David at the time. Yeah, pregnant with David. Yeah, yeah it was a was diff difficult time. He, it was a difficult time. But, but David was born at the time, though. And David was born uh, like six months after Joseph was killed. David never knew his father. Right. And so they all climb on a, a steamboat, and ply, the, the boat plied up the Mississippi, up to Whiteside County, where uh, they rented a, a house, and um, and we we're going to establish a, a life without the reorganization. She did not want to be Emma Hale Smith, uh, first lady. Uh, had no intention. The way Brigham Young treated her, there's no way she's going to be an LDS Mormon. I mean, right. that ain't going to happen. Uh, so she just escaped. That is until uh, Abram Van Tyle, the guy she she rented the moat, he came late on his payments. Uh oh. Yeah, yeah. And uh, word got to her that, hey, he's loading 
furniture on a barge. And if you don't get back there quick, you're going to lose all the, uh, I mean, he's head, he's heading south down river. So she jumped in a wagon, um, um, uh, John Bernheisel, um, uh, is the one who told her, told her about it. And, and she, she pulled up in the, in the buggy in, in front of the mansion house while he was loading stuff on and they had words and he, he just fled. He just, he just left. And that's the last, last the guy, the guy she was leasing. To. Yeah. 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 And taking several months of back, back rent that he was supposed to pay her. So she is, she's out. I mean, she's, just, but she got the furniture at least. At least she got the furniture back, but, but that's all you can see. All you could, that's right. because the barge was sitting over there on, uh, Tied up on a by a tree, uh, um, and they were, so she was lucky to she was lucky to get that. Uh, so she rented out the, the mansion house, moved back to, to Nauvoo, rented the mansion house, and then by 1860, when the reorganization was established, the new organization, uh, Nauvoo became um, Nauvoo became the f- first world church headquarters. For the reorganized church. Oh wow! Here, go ahead and show that to the camera. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. The the first world church headquarters for the for the reorganization, and it was that until 1866, 1867. Okay. Yeah. And, when, and so that's what brought her back was to get the furniture and hopefully collect some money, which she never which did. She never did. Which she never did. Uh, Is that where she met Louis Biedemann? Louis Biedemann. Uh, yeah. About that time. Louis Biedemann was a teamster. He w- drove a wagon between the Nauvoo house, or excuse me, the mansion or red brick store and, and the Chicago markets. <clears throat> That's where a lot of the supplies came from that were sold in the red brick store. Well, he was a teamster and had lots of negotiations between uh, him and, and um, um, uh, Joseph Jr., uh, so that when Joseph died, oh, you see, so he knew Joseph Jr. Oh yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the the papers I had the the pleasure of looking at at the papers um, at San Marino, uh, California, because that's where the Biden papers ended up. Oh, and uh, they're there for for researchers to read, and and uh, and some of my volume three. Cites the uh, the uh, Huntington Library in San Marino. Uh, th- those original papers. There's no question. I mean, there's no question. They they knew each other. Um, and when Joseph was gone, there was I shouldn't be so glib, but it was a target rich environment for Lou for for Louis Bynum. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, he was a wonderful. Wonderful man, uh, eccentric, um, bald as a cue ball, but he wore oh. uh, a toupee. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, and he always wore a citizen's hat to keep it on. And uh, one one day when he was courting Emma, um, he's infatuated, and Emma is too. And Joseph Joseph the Third is in the up upper window. This is Joseph the Third now. In the mansion house? In the mansion house, yes. And he could see Lewis come a calling, right? And Emma happened, just so happens that Emma was kind of sitting in a doorway, you know, just knitting, you're doing just uh, trying to be inconspicuous, inconspicuously observant. And Biden saw her and kind of forgot himself. Ducked under a clothesline and didn't make it. Uh oh! Off came the hat. <laughs> off came the toupee, and both Emma and Joseph the Third saw him co- kind of collect himself, like we got low bridge with his clothesline. Oh no! And he quickly put his hat on and put his or put his hair on and put his hat on. And continued on and just had, you know, like a, like nothing happened, <laughs> you know, happy as a lark, you know. <laughs> and what's so significant about that story is it says a lot about Louis Biedemann. Mm-hmm. He's a man of, he is a man who is 
confident of himself hmm. that he's willing to to laugh at something like that when he, he could have been embarrassed and like I would have been, oh my gosh, mortified. Yeah. He just kind of passed it off and I mean there's Emma and I Emma, you know. And eventually, as you point out, they got married on Joseph's birthday. We were we were talking about that yeah. before we got on camera. And I have to say, my first visit to Nauvoo, I believe it was 2002, um, we went for the Nauvoo Temple Open House. Yeah. And my mom had told me that a former bishop and institute teacher had, had written a family, written a story, uh, a book about what happened to the family of Joseph Smith. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about Lewis. I didn't know Emma got remarried. I didn't know sure, anything about Lewis. Sure. Him. And it almost offended me <laughs> that they married on Joseph's birthday. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, uh, you, it, it, it's not a coincidence, of course. Of, well, now, Lewis Bideman, there, that famous portrait of Joseph Smith, which is in the Community of Christ, Temple. The Sutcliffe Mosley, is yeah, that what you're talking about? Mosley, the Mosley portrait. Biteman referred to him as as Mr. Smith, uh, you know, in honor. Mm-hmm. Uh, allowed the portrait to hang in the north room of the of the mansion house. Um he was he was confident of himself. However, having said that, Rick, um uh how do I say this? Because I'm on camera. Okay. Um, <laughs> you don't want to get in trouble. He he um, had an affair. Yes. Let's just let's just I know, call it spade a spade. Thing. He had an affair, and the re- product of that affair was a young boy mm-hmm. uh, by the name of Charles Edwin Bideman. It wasn't spiritual wifery. No, 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 Mona me. Uh, no, no, uh, not spiritual. It was just. Um, a plain old fashioned affair. It's an old fashioned. She was she was a seamstress, according to the uh, to the census. Uh, uh, you, you can look. You can find it on the census uh, identifying her living uh, outside the township and out in Hancock County. She had a farm. Uh, what was her name? That's right there. Anyway, she she. Couldn't raise. She already had a child out of, and the second, first child. She had two children. She had first child was out of wedlock. Oh wow! And so was she LDS or Mormon? No, 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 no. no not 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 affiliated. Because he a, wasn't. He was. Nor was he. Not until not until he, until his last. His, it was a deathbed conversion. Oh yeah. Um, did, did Emma marry him because he wasn't religious? Do you think? Um, I. Th- I think so. I think Emma married Louis Biedemann because she was a single woman with a family on the Illinois frontier, having to manage two businesses, three businesses, the mansion house, the three three um, businesses with the Nauvoo house, the mansion house, and the red brick store. She had a family. She... And for her to, to exist by herself would have been a real challenge. Right. And here's Louis Biedemann, who also has two children, and uh, uh, older though, much much older, um, and uh, she needed somebody, and they 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 married in December of, eight, of 1847. Uh, Two years later, it was a gold rush. So Biteman and, and his brother decided they're going to go strike it rich. And interestingly enough, they stayed in contact. The letters are there. Fascinating letters. Oh, that's why the letters in California because he was in California. Well, yeah. Went, well, yes. Actually, Charlie. Uh, Charlie was a little boy born out of wedlock. Oh, okay. Emma invited. Boy, now here's here's something about Emma. She invited. Oh, Nancy Abercrombie. Abercrombie, yeah. Yeah, there were two oh, Nancys. So Abercrombie's child, Charlie Bideman, came and lived at Emma's invitation in the mansion house. So he, he, he could be near his father, okay? After a period of time, it was clear that Nancy Abercrombie couldn't survive out on the frontier on the farm. 
So she, Emma, invited Nancy Abercrombie to come and live in the mansion house. Okay, now that's, that says... That's not a story told in the LDS church oh, is that at right? all. Oh, my at gosh. All. Well, well, okay. So uh, in April of 1870, this gets even better. April 1879, Emma's literally on her deathbed. I mean, everyone knows she's about to breathe her last breaths. When she asks for Nancy Abercrombie to come to her in the bed, you know, she whispers it because that's all she can muster up, and she grabs Nancy Abercrombie's hand and Lewis's hand and said, please marry and give Charlie, this is a quote now, proper parentage, proper parentage. Then a day or so later, she passes. Oh, wow. And so that's the story. So how is it that the vitamin paper sends up to San Marino in Huntington? Is that Charlie took the collection and went out there. He he um, followed the migrations west, went to went to uh, San Marino, and that the papers are there. Uh, it's a fascinating story. Fascinating story. Yeah, it really. That is. was amazing. I. This is the M.S. Smith that that Brigham Young excoriated. <laughs> <laughs> well, in our church for a long time, because of Brigham Young, I would say. Um, we didn't like Emma. She's making a comeback, but we don't hear these stories about oh, I, Louis, yeah. Louis Biderman. I don't think I've ever heard his name ever oh, my goodness. until I read that book in 2002. And I yes. was like, well, Emma got remarried? What? And and then the, the child of an adulterous affair, she takes care of the child. And I think I did hear, I'd forgotten, but I did hear that um, she told uh, Lewis and Nancy, I didn't remember her name, to to marry and, you know, take oh, yeah, care of yeah, Charlie. Yeah, that's, like, holy cow, she's amazing. I mean, it's, it just, it, that's not a, it, I mean, that's it's, it's well known. It's, it's well not known. Not in the LDS church. Not, not in the LDS. Interesting, in 1996, I had just become church historian, okay? I had a wonderful invitation to come out and give papers um, and uh one to the faculty that this is the first time, one to the faculty, and then other to the returning missionaries. In this auditorium, big auditorium, probably five or six hundred people there. Uh, the, the Tribune was there, you know, the World Church Historian visits Salt Lake City type thing. And um, after it was over, I had some fantastic stories about that. Uh, I'll never forget. Uh, I'm standing there. I'm looking at this wonderful audience, brand new, green as gourd, World Church Historian, right out, fresh, out of out of the uh, the UMKC classroom. Okay, so all all of a sudden the lights go poof. Now my papers are right there, and the, for my for my presentation, and then all of a sudden I can't, you know, I can barely see people out there, and all of a sudden I'm telling you, Rick. I'm standing there, and this podium is about belt high, right? All of a sudden, it starts rising. I kid you. Now it's about chest high, and it stops. And I'm mortified. I can't believe this. Well, some guy in the back in one of these view rooms is is adjusting it for me, and, and nobody said a word to me about it. <laughs> I, was, I was having an epiphany. But anyway, uh, okay. So so um, after it's all right, I made my presentation Talk about and they, these are all returned missionaries, as I was told. Okay. Um, and uh, I stepped back and I, I thought nobody did anything. You know, usually a pleasant. Yeah. Pause. <laughs> yeah. We don't clap for that. No, so, no. You guys. So sure I do. <laughs> stepped back and I thought, oh my gosh, Mark, you you have committed heresy in front <laughs> of these wonderful people. When here comes a voice from out of the darkness because I can't see anything. Well, they're starting. The lights are starting to come up. Is it okay if we applaud? <laughs> well, the brethren back there, I, I turn and look back, and they were looking at each other, and they nodded, and they started, so everybody started applauding. <laughs> True story. This was in the conference center? This was in the co- conference center, I believe. It was, yeah. it was on campus. Uh, oh, in, in, in at BYU. At BYU. It was there is BYU. a conference center at BYU. Okay. Yeah, was, that's where it was. Yeah, okay. And, and, and True story. Anyway, anyway that's, that was my baptism 
All right. Um, so we've we've kind of gone up through Emma's lifetime. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, take us through the next. You know, we've got a century to cover in your in your purple book in volume two. Yes, we don't mm-hmm. need to cover everything. But what are some? Give us some of the highlights in the community of Christ. Oh yes, yeah, lots of highlights here. Um, uh, and I'll just do just a, just a couple. Boy, it's tough to say which which I'm going to share. Um, probably. Um, I don't know the uh, the the decade and a half of of uh, Israel Alexander Smith, okay. who who was a a, a, a half brother. And before we get to Israel, let me ask you this: because yes. Fred was his was before Israel as far as prophets, right? It was it was Joseph Smith the third, Fred Frederick, and Frederick, then Mad- Israel. Frederick Madison Smith, and then Israel. So. So what about I, I interviewed Bill Bill uh, Russell? Yeah, he did not have very kind things to say about Fred M. Oh yes, yes, <laughs> the yes. Uh, supreme directional control. That's right. That's right. Um, that's I think it caused a lot of people to leave for the Temple Lot Church, if I remember. Yes, right. that's correct. Uh-huh. And uh, and and I mean, Bill was like he was the worst prophet we've ever had. <laughs> well. Um, that's a value judgment. He, he didn't um, mince any words. Uh, that's that's a value judgment. Yeah, Fred M was was just about the opposite of his father. Um, so Joseph Smith the third died in the nineteen December. Yeah, December of uh, of nineteen. Uh, let's see, December of nineteen twelve, nineteen twelve or nineteen thirteen. Uh, yeah. Okay. Do we have any? Do you have any back and forth? Because I know Joseph oh, yeah. F. Smith yeah. was his cousin, correct? Hiram's, correct. Hiram's son, and so they were both Hiram's son and Joseph's son, yes. kind of going at each other a little bit. Yeah. Do you have yes. any good stories there? That makes. Oh yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, Fred M. You know how I described Joseph the Third as the peacemaker, the the person who always tried to 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 chart a course. A, a, a moderate, a moderate course, right? Uh, not wanting to lean one way or the other, uh, trying to stay true to that. Well, FM, quite the opposite. Frederick Madison. F- uh, Frederick Madison Smith, yes, I, FM. Uh, he goes by FM? Yeah, a lot of people just call him call FM. Where Joseph Smith, you could go up and kind of grab onto his arm and and give a hug, you know, and he would give a hug back, and just very, very delightful. It's FM stern, you would never go up and high, try to high five him or slap him on the back and say hi. I mean, you just just didn't. He was very. Uh, Bill Russell's right in some ways, very authoritarian. Mm-hmm. Um, he. Uh, felt that Zion could only be accomplished by a strong central leadership. And there's where your supreme directional control comes from. Right. He took on the council he took on the Council twelve in nineteen nineteen, the conference of nineteen nineteen, uh, defeated him in a vote. Uh nineteen twenty through nineteen twenty two, you see those guys who were defeated all decided to retire or to leave and in comes FM's people into the Council of Twelve, okay, but he the other is the bishopric. What do you do about the bishopric? Because they control the purse, they control the money, and FM knew he couldn't accomplish what he wanted to accomplish without controlling the money. He looked at the presiding bishopric as purveyors, whereas the first presidency were the decision makers. And there's a big, huge difference. Uh, not a whole lot, I suppose. Not a whole lot unlike the LDS Church, I suppose. Is that right? As far as as, as far as as far as the authority of the presiding bishopric to make a decision as to where, when, and how to spend the money, would that be more the presidency in the twelve? You know, I would say that is pretty hidden from the average member. Um, I do know the presiding bishopric is in, is is in charge of money, just like you said. I do know they built them all. Sure. Um, oh yeah. They're in charge of, I think, temples. But 
Honestly, I don't really know the relationship yeah, between yeah. the president and the presiding bishopric. I know they're separate corporations oh, really? legally. Really? Yeah, you've got the corporation of the presiding bishopric and the corporation of the president. Really? Yeah. Um, it sounds like, I, I mean, honestly, I don't know where the lines are, but it, it sounds like my understanding is there's probably a lot of collaboration between the two. Um you know, the prophet will change the presiding bishopric. I mean, they change. Yeah, yeah. Well, and who knows why or what? Well, there seems to be a sense of uncertainty in your answer. In my circumstance, there's no uncertainty. Uh, the presiding bishopric saw their authority as controlling the spending. Right. Okay? And to have FM come in and challenge that, that, would, that, would, that isn't going to happen. So in 1925, the conference in 1925 came to loggerheads, and FM went, to, you know, they went back and forth on the conference floor like it's typical. For, okay, <laughs> we need to talk about conference because yeah. that's back different. back and forth and went and went and argue, 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 and finally FM said, "I've had enough. Here's my resignation." Fred was going to resign. Fred, yeah, yeah. He says, it's up to you. You can either have me as your prophet president or have them, the presiding bishopric, and it's entirely your decision. And this then, is before the then, membership. And then, he, and then he just walked off walked off the podium. And there, you know, stunned conference. Oh my gosh, how can we how can we exist without a prophet president? You can't do that. So when the vote came in, clearly. FM one. I mean, it was just a. Wow. It was a slam dunk, and it forced a resignation of the members of the of the presiding bishopric, the three members of the presiding bishopric, including. Are you sitting down? Okay, including uh, Israel A. Smith, who was his brother, a counselor and brother counselor to the presiding bishopric. Really, and so there's he wonderful his own to stories. Resign. It's in here. There's wonderful stories of 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 Israel as a counselor to the presiding bishop, writing to his brother, threatening a lawsuit, oh, uh, saying saying if all if everything breaks loose and destroys us as a church, Fred M, you're responsible. You know, uh, and went back and forth like that. And he said, "Forget it. I'm I'm out of here." He left church appointment. Um, he was a lawyer and tried to practice up practice law up on the square, and a disastrous. And it, that's what Bill said. He was a terrible lawyer. Oh, it was awful. He was awful, <laughs> and everybody knew it. I mean, every, everyone everyone knew except except because the church was so large in Independence in Kansas City area. When it came time to rewrite the Constitution of Missouri, state of Missouri, they invited Israel to to join as one of the one of the uh, decision makers, wow. and negotiators for that. But anyway, uh, but anyway, uh, Israel went into destitute poverty. He wrote in one of his letters that they couldn't afford the electricity to run the clock at night. I mean that's that's pretty destitute, right? His his older brother FM took pity on him, brought him back into church appointment, uh, and um, uh, then eventually, um, eventually Israel made his way into um, the first presidency upon the death of um, of FM in March, late March, I think it was March twenty sixth of. 1946, and everyone knew that, you know, interesting enough, you know, the royal bloodline, excuse me, Joseph Seed started to say a royal bloodline, but that's kind of sacri- sacrilege, sorry if it is. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so you got, you got, you got Israel, you got Israel, who's, who's, who is a son, uh-huh. a grandson, but on the other hand, through, you've got, you got through David Hiram Smith, the presiding evangelist, who happens to be a man by the name of Albert A. Smith, so he's got royal bloodline also. Mm-hmm. And boy, uh, Albert A. had been there in the presidency with Joseph the Third. He had been 
presiding patriarch. Everybody knew is uh, Elbert A. Everybody loved Elbert A. Uh, could easily have been the the prophet president instead of Israel, but Elbert A. deferred by in writing that it ought to be Israel, and that solved it. And so, oh, wow. uh, and so it became uh, Israel Smith to to succeed. Okay, I want to take a little tangent for just a minute. Okay. Um, because your general conference is so different than ours. Yes. Or wor- I guess you call it world conference. Um, because I want to make sure I understand if it was – I've been there this week mm-hmm. and, and learning how things are. And, and uh, sure. one of the, the – I guess the biggest difference between LDS and, and uh, Community of Christ – Ours is like everybody comes, we sit there, we listen to the prophets and the apostles in the 70s speak generally, sure. you know, sometimes the young women, presidencies, women. that yeah. sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, it's one-way communication. They speak, we listen, mm-hmm. you know, we'll Do people laugh. have opportunity to raise? No. Well, other than the sustaining of church officers, you can s- sustain, rarely we get a dissent. Can you, can you ask about? The qualifications nope. of individual. <laughs> oh, it's really when I say one way, it's one way communication. Okay. Now with yours, it's clear that it's very two way, or you know, maybe I should say twelve way, <laughs> mm-hmm. because I think there were twelve podiums in the yeah that, that, in that the makes makes sense auditorium yeah yeah, and so, uh, but it's not. On the one hand, you call it a world general conference. And on the one hand, you literally have people coming from Africa and Jamaica and Mexico Mm -hmm. and Honduras Mm -hmm. and Fiji and Tahiti. And I mean, the international representation, it's not a bunch of just white men and women. (laughs) Oh, that's a nice way of saying it. Yeah. So you, in in one sense, you have world representation way more. You know, mostly it's people in Salt Lake that go to the conference center and, and watch. Um, and but don't you have don't you have like members of the seventy that are uh, pe- people of color? Um, yeah, but I'm I mean most of the audience it, it, most of the audience comes from Utah. Utah is white. I yeah. mean, yeah, you know. It, it just Utah's very white. Uh-huh. I mean, we have some Mexicans and some blacks. I'm sure you'll see some. There's some in the choir and that sort sure. of thing. But it's probably 90 percent white. Okay. Um. So the 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 real difference to me because they announced and I I think I think your attendance is probably smaller because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Um. But they announced. I believe you had I want to say 1,400 delegates and about 500. Observers like me, I, I, I can't vote. Mm-hmm. I'm not a delegate, mm-hmm. but you basically you elect in your congregations. Mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure how it works. Mission center at the mission center. Mission level. center, which is kind of like a huge stake, stake. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, in so. LDS parlance, like fifty, sure. twenty to twenty to fifty congregations in mm-hmm. a mission center. You bet. And and so you have these these delegates, and they vote on behalf of their congregation. And Correct. so they're elected by their congregation. Well, they, they, they represent the, the mission center. Okay. Okay. And so unlike, I mean, with LDS General Conference, I mean, they kind of invite different people from the Salt Lake Valley to come, and our attendance is down a little bit for COVID, and also construction downtown Salt Lake. <laughs> um, but... You know, and so when we do the sustaining of of officers or whatever, and you know, once every ten years you'll get some people that will oppose. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas every single one of your votes, you guys have somebody vote, and you don't say, "Go talk to your stake president." It's like, okay, we noted. You know, you're not going to get a talk from your bishop because you disagree. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so it's really different because you have these delegates that yes. vote on yes. these resolutions. And so my question is, um, when Fred was like, 
I'm going to resign unless you kick the presiding bishop or guy. I mean, that was basically the message, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, they both appealed to they both appealed to the delegates to make the decision. And so, the and that probably was a pretty big surprise. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and so, I mean, jaws had to drop. I'm sure. <laughs> and so. Do we have a sense for, let's say, the percentage of delegates that – that, and I guess the auditorium wasn't even built until no, the 50s. No, so, so this, this is, was this been at Stone Church. Oh, it would have been at the Stone mm -hmm. Church. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's a lot yeah. smaller. But um, do we have a sense for the people who supported Fred versus the presiding, presiding bishopric? Yeah. Um. Uh, and these are say. just delegates, not the entire church. Yes, it's hard to say. Oh, say that part again. It's De the delegates who voted on this, not right. the entire church. Correct. They were voting correct. on behalf of the mission centers yes, that's or the correct. stakes, I guess. Yeah, and, and people, yeah, pe people were pretty diligent about voting for, uh, about sending to to the conference those who were of like mind. Right. So they would have confidence. Uh, they would have confidence in the decision-making process. Uh, the conference is the highest decision-making body in the in the community of Christ. The conference is uh, the delegates uh, in conference assembled is the way is the way to describe it. It would be difficult to quantify that, though. Um, but there was a protest movement that emerged, a significant protest movement. Um, as a matter of fact, it was large enough to where on the issue of supreme directional control was not resolved um, as to who who was supported and who wouldn't. You're asking a great question here. It was unresolved enough to where uh, Albert A. Smith, that would be David Hiram's son, Albert A. Smith went to the Hedrickites. That's what I thought. Across the street. Oh, okay. That was said, the big look, influx into the temple. Life. Right. He said, look, uh, we will recognize your authority, your priesthood authority should you want to come and join us. I mean, you are a group, a restorationist group, having, having you know, Granville Hedrick and so on. If you want to come and join us as a movement, we will recognize your membership and your priesthood, should you be able, because he knew that they would, as a deal, they were trying to cut a deal on the supreme directional control. So this is the 1920s? 1920, 25. 25, okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now just to make sure the story's clear, uh, that never happened. Uh, the vote took place in Fred M1. Uh, a segment of the of the church separated away and created a kind of restorationist group. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it took some very impressive people. Well, a, a lot of them did join the temple out, though, didn't? Yeah, they? some of them did. Some of them did. Um, uh, some of them. Um, the couple of apostles left. Was Otto Fetting one of those? I, I don't know if he was. He wasn't an apostle, but Fetting was 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 one of those who who separated away, right? Uh, and started a, started his own own little group. Um, well, he joined the temple lot. Yes, started the yes, build the temple, and then yes, the depression then, hit. Then it, you know, that's what you got to understand about rest about the restoration about Latter Day Saintism, right? Imbued in the the very core of restoration of the, of the reorganization and, and LDS is this sense of willingness to separate away. <laughs> I mean, it's just that's just part of it. Just comes with comes with the territory, so to speak. We're familiar with the polygamists who step away, yes. but we're not as familiar with our oh, LDS. Listen, listen, do we? You know, I got a phone call one time from a, a reporter from the Kansas City Star uh -huh. asking about a a group. You know, how many restorationists are there? Asking what you, and I said, "Ma'am, I can't, I can't tell you because every time they have a business, a bad business meeting, 
another group breaks up <laughs> <laughs> over over the issue. You know, so it's, it was hard to keep up. And I, now I don't want to discount any of the spirituality of, of these people. Right. Um, uh, some of my own relatives are, are are restorationists, and and they're very spiritual spiritual people. Mm-hmm. So it's not like it's not like they're. I mean, it's it's a serious business. I mean, it's it's very serious spirituality, and I honor that. I I uh, I th- I high five them in, mm-hmm. in in their journey. It's not my journey; it's their journey. Their journey is not my journey. It's, that's human nature. I mean, that's that's the way it's supposed to be in my mind. So anyway, in twenty five, you had this group separating away, and. Uh, again, some some very wonderful people uh, broke away. In, in, in terms of numbers, maybe a fourth. I don't know. That it's not appropriate for me to speculate on that because I simply don't know. No one, no one's ever, to my knowledge, ever quantified it. As far as I know, it seems like I believe it was Adam Stokes. I remember right. He's an apostle for the Elijah Message Church, which is auto fetting, mm-hmm. and uh, it sounded like the temple lot was very small, a mm-hmm. hundred people, and he yeah. thinks as many as a thousand came to the temple lot, which for our LDS that wasn't very much, but for the temple lot that was a huge that was a influx. Huge, that would have been a huge influx. And then, um, and then yeah. Otto said, "Hey, let's uh, build the temple." Dig the hole, depression hits, yeah. they run out of money, that hole stays there through Harry Truman's presence. But, but they found a stone, right? They did found two stones. Oh, two stones, okay, excuse yeah. me, excuse me. And so, but then, well, and I find this a really interesting thing because this is actually <clears throat> still coming up in the current conference. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when Brigham Young moved to Utah. Everybody got rebaptized, mm-hmm. oh, but yeah. in the RLDS church, nobody got rebaptized because well, some people did. Some, okay, some but, people did but, if their choice. Yeah, but yes. like Emma didn't get rebaptized. Right. Like, Lord she's Joseph like, the I was Third. already baptized. I don't right. need to do it again. And right. so I know that has been a big thing. We were talking about moving over to Temple Lot. Sure. And so Otto Fetting moves over to the Temple Lot, mm-hmm. and. And they recognize the baptism and the priesthood. And the priesthood, I was going to say, you bet. Big deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and then, we did too. Yeah. We did too. If if the person did not participate in any kind of protest uh, during their tenure as uh, services in the priesthood, we we embraced that. Yeah. We they had to be to, able to prove. They just couldn't walk in and say, "Hey, I'm an elder or uh, somewhere." They had to be able to prove that. But but the district is the where is where that approval would take place. Yeah. Um, and so this has been almost, can I say, an article of faith uh-huh. in the community of Christ that you don't need to be rebaptized so long as you're at least eight. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when Otto Fetting went over to the temple lot, he created a huge controversy when he said, "We need to be rebaptized. We need to be committed." And they kicked him out. <laughs> <laughs> And they're like, no, we don't do rebaptism. <laughs> we're we're members of the original Joseph Smith Church, and so so then Otto started the the Fettingite movement or the Church right. of the Elijah Message, mm-hmm. um, which is schismed again. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't want to get too far into that. But it's interesting because even in the current world conference, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of interesting. First of all, it was surprising to me that it took a day and a half because they had this resolution. Yeah. And the resolution, I'm going to try to summarize it briefly, was basically first presidency, we want you to pray about Mm -hmm. whether we can accept infant baptisms because you've always had to be the community of Christ recognizes anybody's baptism, Methodist. Age of accountability, right? As long as you're at least eight. Right. Uh, LDS baptisms are fine. Methodist, Baptist, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We'll accept it as long as you're at least eight. Um, And so apparently in Europe, at least what I gather was, you know, everybody's Catholic there. Everybody Mm -hmm. gets baptized as infants. Or Lutheran. Mm -hmm. And they get baptized as infants, and they don't want to get rebaptized. And, you know, in one sense, it's hurting missionary work. Um, But then you had some other staunch RLDS people or Community of Christ. I use them interchangeably. 
um, that said, wait a minute. I'm teaching seven-year-olds that they can't be baptized until they're eight, and then this five-year-old can take communion because they were baptized. That doesn't make that's not fair. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. And then the Germans were like, "But you don't understand. In Europe, like nobody will join." <laughs> <laughs> so first presidency, will well, you just pray about this? And then it's and there were amendments to and amendments sure, to the amendments. Sure. Yeah. And then typical, oh, typical. It was you know. I mean, it takes I, a parliamentarian just to keep up with everything. And I, I, I talked to a few people, and they were like, "You know, we really know how to waste time." <laughs> <laughs> and so it's interesting yeah. once again with the LDS Church, very top-down, one-way yeah. communication. Yeah. Yeah. It is not that way. No. I mean, you've got President Vizi up there. The chair recognizes podium number eleven. Yeah. You know, speaking in English. Well, it comes up on a prompt. Yeah. Yeah. And he and reads he, off of You know, yeah. state your question or, yeah. your, you know, whatever you're trying mm-hmm. to do. And then they debate it back and forth. And it was just like, holy cow, <laughs> this is taking a long time. That's the way, that's, tis, that's the animal. And so. it's been that way. Is that through the history of the church? Uh, to, 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 yeah, yeah, most mostly so, yeah. Does this conference here that I'm attending this week, does it seem especially slow? <laughs> oh, uh, does it drone on and on, so well, to speak? Like, I know the baptism resolution, it took them a day and a half to resolve mm-hmm. that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I that's understand. a big issue, though. That's, that's, that's a big issue yeah. for, for us. And then the climate change resolution, that mm-hmm. one went pretty quick, yeah, apparently. That, that's then consensus on that. Was it, I don't know if it was the marriage resolution. No, the marriage is what we're doing now. The, um, was it the race? Did you hear about the race? Racism. Uh-huh. Racism. <laughs> I'm going to give my summary. Okay, I wasn't go. there because I was up in, up in Iowa for a little bit. But what I understand, what I was told there were some people who wanted to apologize for past racism. Yeah. That took another day and a half to <laughs> go through the amendments and resolve and this and that. Yeah, yeah. The change a resolve to a whereas and and then finally passed it. And then they came back from lunch. And the message I heard was, our lawyer said we can't do anything about this. So, you know, we're not going to discuss this and anymore. And that, that could have happened – a day and a half earlier. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, why but, didn't the lawyers speak okay. up a long time okay. ago? Okay, so so here's the issue. The, the first president, we want to make sure that everybody has a voice mm-hmm. and have the opportunity to, to share what's on their mind. Okay. Um, and for that lawyer to stand up and just slam dunk it at the very beginning would have denied the people opportunity oh, to, be really? able, be, to be able to share. Absolutely. And, and it's the prerogative of the chair to allow the discussions to continue as long as he feels that it's appropriate. And at some point, he will simply, he'll simply break it off. Uh, uh, and generally, generally speaking, that the people will tire of the, of the going back and forth, unless it's super hot. Uh, 1984, I'm sure, was super hot. 1984 is a good example of that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So... That's that's the way that's the way that welcome welcome to the community of Christ. <laughs> I love it. I mean, on the one hand, I admire that you can. I don't know if I should say talk back because it's not. It's very respectful, but mm-hmm. you can you can voice your opinion to the prophet, and the prophet will listen to you. Absolutely, and Absolutely. so that's fantastic because it doesn't feel like the LDS Church is interested in any feedback loop. They're like, go talk to your bishop, and then it just dies. And so you can literally speak to the prophet. The prophet will listen to you. Uh, apparently, the lawyers get involved in that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, uh, but that's interesting. That's yeah, interesting. Oh, yeah, that's why that's, they left that to go on that's, so long. Tis, tis the nature of, of, of community of Christ is a very grassroots-driven uh, organization. Now, of course, there's the First Presidency, and of course, there's the Council of the Twelve, and of course, there are the Seventies and, and the Presiding bishopric and so on. There is that, there is that hierarchical structure to right. be sure. But boy, you know, the, when the decisions are made on the conference floor, the hands are tied. I mean, if and that give me a good example. We we now have a three year cycle, right? 
right three years ago. Didn't used to be that way. Uh, 1923, 1923 was the first. Twenty one to twenty three was was a two year period, and we've had it two years ever since. However, having said, except for except for when um, President VC when President uh, McMurray resigned and had to be replaced, but in the two thousand yeah, that was a sudden resignation, that, right? That was. I'm sorry. A sudden, very unexpected uh, resignation. Yeah, yeah, it was. It, it was. But the the point being is that the first presidency has the prerogative of calling for a conference at any time, anywhere, anytime. Oh. We've always had it. We've always had it independence because of the facilities. Okay. But there's nothing sacred about that. I mean, they they could have it in Lamoni. They could have it. Salt Lake City. Salt, Salt Lake City. The we conference a, center, we right? We a big conference center. We'd have to get a bunch more podiums. That, 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 that'd be a sight, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> with with the, the Jesus and how that big towering statue of Jesus with these. Okay. Um, and, and, the, and the brethren standing underneath uh, with. Oh no! I I apologize for that. <laughs> Are you oh. talking about the gold? No, I'm not talking about anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. So okay. So what 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 were we saying? Um, Just the the feedback in the community. Of oh Christ. yeah. Oh yeah. Very much so. Very much so. And uh, it uh, you the order in which they chime in is how is, is the order in which he appoints or, or identifies some. When you say some are, I mean, it's always it's always cordial and pleasant. <laughs> no, well, I, I know. <laughs> I mean, it, I know it for is, a fact there, eighty four was you mentioned, very. Uncordial. You mentioned that nineteen eighty four, probably the nineteen eighty six World Conference was the most contentious. Uh, contentious. Okay, uh, I I remember that very very well. Was that because oh. they were trying to rescind the female ordination? Or, yes, uh-huh. oh, eighty four really? section one fifty six was passed in eighty four uh, to the chagrin, and so now they have a two year time frame of splitting off, splintering because of that. Right. So a lot of them, a lot of them left, not. Removing their membership, they just simply left, which then enabled them to become delegates to the mission center. The stakes could they they could they could they could dominate. They could fill they they could fill the pews at the stake level on the day of the election of delegates. Okay. You see how you see how stack stack the deck. That's another thing. So I hear because I think somebody told me that um, these like these debates that go back and forth. Yes, those happen in the mission centers or the stakes oh, that, yeah, all the time. Correct, correct. All these issues, all these issues are discussed. It was like couldn't months, they get the wording months. right the first time? No, no. All these all these issues are discussed months. They they published they published it. Uh, in in the January Herald, I mean everybody everybody knows the issues, right? Um, so it's not like they come in not knowing. Uh, I mean, nobody nobody is surprised, and if they're if they are surprised, they're in the wrong well, wrong except seat. Except for when Fred M offered to resign. But except that that, <laughs> that that was a shocker. That that <laughs> was, that was a shocker. Um, but he had successfully defeated the twelve in 1919. So and here is and they meet every year, boom, boom, boom. Okay, so and, they were yearly for a yes, while. Yes, at that point, it's not until twenty this between twenty one and twenty three. Uh, Fred M was in Europe at the time, and they weren't going to have a, a conference with the prophet gone, so they decided, okay, postpone the next year. So then, then you have uh, every every other year <clears throat> from that from that point forward. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Mark Shearer, former Community of Christ Church historian. In our next conversation, we're going to find an interesting story with David O. McKay and Community of Christ prophet Israel Smith. When it came time, uh, uh, they asked, you know, if you were willing to sustain David O. McKay as church president, please raise your hand. Well, of course, everybody raised their hand. Well, sure enough, 
here comes the hand of Israel Smith. Oh, no way. And Israel Smith then votes to sustain David O. McKay as president of the church. Oh, wow. Okay, so in the audience are RLDS church members just kind of sprinkled around the back, right? Okay. It is a firestorm. Oh, no. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. It is. It dominates the airwaves. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, you can hear the audio only at patreon.com slash gospel tangents. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview with no interruptions. If you want to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can also sign up at Patreon or on youtube.com slash gospel tangents and just subscribe here. You can watch the entire video uncut before everybody else. Also, if you'd like to continue to support Gospel Tangents, you can either sign up for our $10 or $20 memberships, or you can get some cool gear like this hat. Um, I've got the coffee mugs like this here. Uh, we've got sweatshirts and t-shirts, and I'm even thinking about ties. Somebody said they wanted a tie, so I'll see if I can get that on my store. So go to gospeltangents.com store, and you can get some Gospel Tangents gear. So you don't want to miss that. So anyway, thanks for listening. If you'd like to check out some of our other videos, check out here.